Fact. Every incovenant believer will be given back an upgraded version of their body at the first resurrection on the day of the Lord, just like Jesus Christ received at his resurrection. Join me as I explore what that really means according to the scriptures. Let's start this video off by reflecting on the questions that are posed within the following two separate passages. 1 Corinthians 15.35 says, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? 2 Baruch 49.1-3 says, Nevertheless, I will again ask from you, O mighty one, yes, I will ask you who made all things, in what shape will those live who live in your day? Or how will the splendor of those who are after that time continue? Will I then resume this form of the present, and put on these entangling members, which are now involved in evils, and in which evils are consummated? Or will you perhaps change these things, which have been in the world, as also the world? The scriptures are free from obscurity regarding what has been promised to those who walk in covenant with the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And what has been promised is immortality, citizenship within a new and perfect country, and fellowship with Yahweh, his Son, and all the spiritual hosts of heaven. But how does God plan on fulfilling these promises? Is there a living example that we can draw our comprehension from, so that we aren't left with conjecture and guesswork? Yes. His name is Yeshua, the Son of the God of these promises. He's the first, and currently only one, of many to receive what God has vowed. So, how did Yeshua attain his immortal status and place of heavenly residence? Being born again is a term that Christ used to teach about the absolutely necessary requirement for one to be resurrected into eternal life in order to see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When questioned by the prophet Baruch with regards to those who will be brought into physical existence again, Yahweh says, For they shall behold the world which is now invisible to them, and they shall behold the time which is now hidden from them, and time shall no longer age them. Transitioning from simply seeing the kingdom of God and the world to come, Christ then tells Nicodemus that in order to physically enter the kingdom of God, one must be born of water and spirit. John 3.5 says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There are two elements that comprise a resurrected human being, water and spirit. You and I, non-resurrected human beings, are derived from the dirt of the earth, mixed with God's breath of life. Pertaining to those who will be born of water and spirit, Yahweh informs Baruch that, their splendor shall be glorified in changes, and the form of their face shall be turned into the light of their beauty, that they may be able to acquire and receive the world which does not die, which is then promised to them. In order to acquire and receive the world which does not die, there needs to be a physical alteration in the properties of our nature in order to properly facilitate God's promises. In the next part of Jesus' exchange with Nicodemus, he makes a brief contrast between two biologically different natures. John 3.6 says, That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the spirit is spirit. It's simple. If you were born from human flesh, then that makes you human flesh. If you were born from spirit, which is completely different and far more superior to human flesh, then that makes you a spirit being. Aside from God himself and the angels he created, Yeshua is currently the only man who can boast of being born of the Spirit. He is the prototypical example of resurrected mankind. Paul says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
Paul used the term first fruits as an analogous reference with the intention of pointing to the annual feast of weeks and first fruits. As part of the celebration, the Hebrews, who participated in an agrarian culture, were instructed to offer the first of their harvest to Yahweh on this day. The resurrection of the dead in Christ is likened to a great harvest of souls who will be raised from Sheol and brought into the kingdom of God at Christ's return. Apart from us, Christ already has a resurrected body and already dwells in the house of God, and so he can be likened to a first fruit offering, as opposed to all of us saints of God who will enter into his house at a later date. This next passage in John 3 is so intelligible, yet the wisest of theologians have struggled with how to interpret it. Sadly, many of the professed wise seem to miss the straightforward and overt meaning of Yeshua's overarching message in this chapter. John 3, 7-8 says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. One of the spiritual properties of a born-again spirit body is to be able to come and go like the wind, undetected. Jesus displayed this behavior when he passed through the walls of the house where his disciples were gathered after his resurrection. He showed up through locked doors, uninhibited and in surprising fashion. All of the aforementioned passages in John 3 have never been speaking about one's moment of conversion or about the concept of baptism. The true meaning of what the Messiah was teaching Nicodemus has been hijacked and replaced with something of much lesser value. Christ was attempting to penetrate the layers of Judaism and vain traditions that enveloped Nicodemus' heart by plainly explaining to him that God has a literal kingdom and that in order to dwell within God's literal kingdom, God needs to provide him with a specific type of body that can make such an experience actually happen. Once again, that type of body, according to the words of God's Son, needs to be built of water and spirit. Most Christians have no problem believing that they are the progeny of a man who was made from the dust and dirt of the earth, which is a truth found in Genesis 2 verse 7. However, Adam was not the only creature that was made from the materials formed out of the dirt of the earth. As Genesis 1 24-25 asserts, cattle, beasts, and creeping things were all fashioned out of the same earthy material as well. Aquatic and avian creatures, however, were not made from earthy materials. They were made from something else. Second Ezra 6, 47-48 says, On the fifth day you did command the seventh part, where the water had been gathered together, to bring forth living creatures, birds, and fishes. And so it was done. The dumb and lifeless water produced living creatures, as it was commanded, that therefore the nations might declare your wondrous works. The bird and fish kind were brought forth from aqueous material, Paul was certainly aware of the different types of flesh that the Father created and where they came from. 1 Corinthians 15.39 says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. Men and beasts have flesh that were fashioned from earth. Birds and fish have flesh that were fashioned from water. If the origination of all life forms were initially derived from these two materials, would it be implausible for Yahweh to craft the new, spiritual flesh of his resurrected sons and daughters out of water and spirit? That's the point I'm trying to make here. It shouldn't seem silly, ridiculous, or far-fetched for us to believe this. Again, the Apostle Paul fully understood that we needed to become a new man, born as a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, New things have come. Just as people have historically struggled with what Yeshua was explaining to Nicodemus, people have also struggled with their understanding regarding the soteriology that Paul taught to various churches in the first century AD. Soteriology is just a fancy word that means the study of the doctrine of salvation. Being born again, as Yeshua put it, is directly tied to being saved on the day of the Lord. Being a new creation in Christ, as Paul put it, was originally understood in light of the coming resurrection and glory of immortality. Nowadays, it is commonly taught that you and I are literally a new creation right now, and that the old things have already passed away, and that the new things have literally come as well. This is not 
what Paul was trying to convey as he admonished and encouraged the congregants of his church plants. Paul spoke in a way that we now define in modern Western linguistics as prolepsis. Simply put, Paul wanted the recipients of his letters to have total and immutable faith in the promise of the resurrection to come, and to carry so much hope in it that they would already consider themselves as being a new immortal creation in their present state, walking in righteousness and holiness as though they were currently immortals with God's spiritual law emblazoned on their hearts. He pointed their minds and hearts forward in hopes that it would encourage them to live like perfectly glorified children in the here and now. Paul, who was formerly of the sect of the Pharisees and indoctrinated into the same misunderstandings as Nicodemus before he was given the eyes to see, had full knowledge of what Yeshua was attempting to teach Nicodemus. 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44 says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a corruptible body. It is raised an incorruptible body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Instead of copying Christ's birthing analogy to make his point, Paul draws on his Hebraic agrarian roots in order to help people comprehend the differences between a natural body of mortal flesh versus a spiritual body of immortal flesh. Yeshua is the only man to have had a natural body and then receive his glorified spiritual body at his resurrection. Because of everything that Christ accomplished during his sinless life and ministry, he was granted the authority to help us get to the same spiritual status that he currently experiences. Philippians 3, 20-21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by his working through which he is able to even subject all things to himself. We are proleptic citizens of a coming country, which is being hidden in the heavens above for us. At the appointed time of Christ's return to the earth, not only is he given the power by his Father to resurrect us, transforming our natural bodies into spiritual bodies, but he will also bring with him the home that we are future citizens of as well. I'd like to reorient this teaching back to what took place at Christ's own resurrection event. Recently, I received the comment that's up on your screen and thought this particular video would be an appropriate one to provide an answer. And it's a great question. What did happen to the mortal body of Christ that was laid to rest in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? Did he resurrect back into his mortal body? Did his body simply disappear? Luke 24, 1-3 says, Now on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Yeshua's body was indeed gone, and two angels confirmed this to be true as found in Luke 24, 6-7, which says, He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So, is the implication that the risen Christ received back his body of flesh? Yes. And no. Let's keep digging. There's a specific prophecy located in Psalm 16 that may help us. Speaking about Christ, the patriarch David prophesied, saying, For you will not forsake my soul to Sheol. You will not give your Holy One over to see corruption. David spoke about how Christ's soul would not be forsaken in the underworld, and that God would not allow him to see corruption. Peter, one of Yeshua's closest disciples, helps us better understand David's prophetic utterance regarding the resurrection of the Messiah and how it relates to that Davidic passage. Acts 2, 29-32 says, Men, brothers, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to set one of the fruit of his body on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither forsaken to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption, this Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. What was Peter asserting here? 1. 
David died, was buried, and his tomb exists as evidence for that. In other words, David's flesh saw corruption and decayed, and his soul still remains in Sheol. All that's left of David's body are his bones and his tomb. He waits to be resurrected. 2. Christ's soul was not abandoned to the intermission of the underworld, and his flesh did not see corruption and decay. In other words, God released Christ's soul from Sheol, and Christ received his body back. Just to be clear, Yeshua didn't simply receive his earth-based mortal body. It underwent an upgrade that's akin to what Paul mentions about a select group of believers in the future who are said to be alive and remaining at the coming of Christ. Let's read about that. To his Corinthian audience, Paul boldly declared, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. And to Paul's Thessalonian audience, he adds, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. What Paul is describing in his correspondence here is that the bodies of those who are alive and remain during a very specific eschatological period of time will undergo a change in their bodies and that this change will happen suddenly, as quick as the twinkling of an eye. Mortal flesh will convert to immortal flesh. Earth-based bodies will transform into spiritual bodies of water and spirit. This is what happened to the body of Christ after his soul spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just like those who will be raised incorruptible at his return, Christ was raised incorruptible by his Father. Because Yeshua's body didn't undergo decay, it was changed in the twinkling of an eye while in the tomb, just like the bodies of those who will be alive and remaining at Christ's return. The latter people's bodies will not undergo decay, being that they will be living when he returns to resurrect all who are waiting on his salvation. Okay, so Christ has this fabulous new body. He's born again. And what does he do? He starts putting it to the test. He puts the power of his body on display for his disciples to see. John 20, 19 says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Or in Hebrew, he said, Shalom Aleichem. I love how John tells us that the doors were shut and locked, which just adds emphasis to how amazing Yeshua's sudden appearance really was. Luke provides us with the disciples' response to Yeshua's startling presentation. Luke 24, 37-39 says, But being startled and frightened, they were thinking they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me, and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Now wait just a second. Is Christ contradicting his pre-resurrected self by what he asserted here in his post-resurrection body? No, of course not. He did indeed have flesh and bones. Then what does Paul mean when he says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam, referring to Christ, became a life-giving spirit, as Paul puts it. But didn't Jesus say that he had flesh and bones? Hopefully by now you're realizing that a spiritual body is a corporeal body that has substance, structure, and advanced biology. Just like he taught Nicodemus, Yeshua himself was born again into a body of water and spirit. To reiterate, all bodies have substance, whether heavenly or earthly. Paul says that there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. Heavenly bodies have flesh, just not earth-based flesh. Those who have heavenly spiritual bodies can be handled and touched, as Christ exemplified to his friends. The reason why the disciples were startled when Christ first appeared to them 
was because they thought they were seeing a disembodied apparition. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Yeshua's disciples were well aware of his horrific death on the cross and that he, like all men eventually do, ended up dying. As is indicated in the Gospel writings, his disciples never seemed to understand what Jesus was telling them when he said that it was necessary for him to die and then be resurrected. Christ needed to don a body that would allow him access into his Father's kingdom. Yahweh granted him such a body. Quick recap. Yeshua kept his mortal body, which was then transformed into an immortal spiritual body at his resurrection. Those classified as alive and remaining at Christ's second coming will keep their mortal bodies, which will be transformed into immortal spiritual bodies as well. But what about all the dead in Christ? What about all those bodies of believers who saw corruption and whose bodies decayed and returned back to the earth-based material from which they were all created from? This is where a very interesting and revealing passage found in Ezekiel 37 comes to life, pun intended. Reading out of the Greek Septuagint, Ezekiel 37, 1-14 says, And the hand of the Lord came upon me, and the Lord brought me forth by the Spirit, and set me in the midst of the plain, and it was full of human bones. And he led me round about them every way. And behold, there were very many on the face of the plain, very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, will these bones live? And I said, O Lord God, you know this. And he said to me, Prophesy upon these bones, and you will say to them, You dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord to these bones, Behold, I will bring upon you the breath of life, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and will spread skin upon you, and will put my spirit into you, and you will live, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and it came to pass while I was prophesying, that behold, there was a shaking, and the bones approached each one to his joint. And I looked, and behold, sinews and flesh grew upon them, and skin came upon them above. But there was not breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord, Come from the four winds, and breathe upon these dead men, and let them live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, a very great congregation. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And they say, Our bones are become dry, our hope is perished, we are quite spent. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will open your tombs and will bring you up out of your tombs, and will bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Lord, when I have opened your graves, that I may bring up my people from their graves. And I will put my spirit within you, and you will live, and I will place you upon your own land. And you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and will do it, saith the Lord. The imagery in Ezekiel's vision isn't a metaphor. Yahweh will bring every incovenant man and woman's bones back to life. They will be wrapped in flesh, sinew, and skin again. Notice that blood is not mentioned in either Ezekiel 37 nor in Luke 24. The scriptures say that our lives are in our blood. At the resurrection, our bodies will include the fullness of the Spirit of God, which means we will not need blood to survive. Our water and spirit bodies will suffice to provide us with our eternal immortal status. As a side note, I also believe that this is why the patriarchs were so concerned with where their corpses were placed, because they knew that they would be resurrected from the dead and that their mortal bones would be refleshed, reskinned, and fully indwelt with the Spirit of God. They wanted to wake up surrounded by their loved ones in their new bodies. If you've made it to the end of the video, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your life to hear this extremely good news. If this material doesn't get you fired up for the resurrection, then I don't know what will. If you got something out of this video, please hit the like button. Feel free to share it on your socials, and of course, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Shalom Aleichem.